Howdy, this is Jim Rutt, and this is The Jim Rutt Show. Listeners have asked us to provide pointers to some of the resources we talk about on the show. We now have links to books and articles referenced in recent podcasts that are available on our website. We also offer full transcripts. Go to jimrutshow.com. That's jimrutshow.com. Today's guest is Ben Gertzel. Ben is one of the world's leading authorities on artificial general intelligence, also known as AGI. Indeed, Ben is the one who coined the phrase, or at least so it's said on Wikipedia and other places. He's also the instigator of the OpenCog project, which is an AGI, open source software project, and SingularityNet, a decentralized network for developing and deploying AI services. Welcome back, Ben. Hey, yeah, good to be here. Yeah, it's been only a couple months since we last chatted, I think, but the AI world is moving fast. It's just amazing to think about everything I've been doing on my own team and that's happened in the world just in the last couple months. Uh, amazing time to be talking about AGI. And as you know, I'm working on a LLM-based project, not AGI, and I've never seen anything like it where the substrate is changing in material ways and the strategic decisions you have to make about which way this high-dimensional space will evolve on a weekly or every two-weekly basis, especially now that the open source models are starting to come to actually bite. Very interesting, very interesting times we live in, as I often say. It reminds me, though at 25 times the speed, of the introduction of the PC to the world around 1979, 1980, where there's just so much low-hanging fruit and so many things you can do as these new affordances come up. But today, we're going to go kind of deep on Ben's main project. Last time, we did a broad, horizontal look at various aspects of the road to AGI. Today, we're going to talk about, mostly from a paper Ben and a bunch of other folks wrote, called OpenCog Hyperon, a framework for AGI at the human level and beyond. Now, we've done this before, and I'm sure Ben's done it so many times he's ready to vomit, but for the audience, let's do a very quick recitation of the difference between narrow AI, AGI, and ASI. Sure. So what I mean by AGI or artificial general intelligence is software that can do smart stuff, you know, solve hard problems, achieve complex goals that are qualitatively different from the training data or the programming with which the system was started out. So it's got to be able to make leaps of generalization. And that's different than just being broad in scope, because say LLMs are broad in scope, but it's largely, though not entirely, it's largely because their training data was so broad in scope in the first place. So they don't need to make a big leap to be broad in scope. And humans are not omnipotent at generalization, but we are able to take fairly substantial leaps beyond our programming and training. We're not the most generally intelligent entities you could imagine. The notion of a super intelligence is an AGI whose general intelligence is far beyond human level, which has many aspects, probably including the ability of that superintelligence to fairly fully understand its own software and hardware and self-improve and self-modify, which humans can do, but only to a quite limited extent. Yeah, and uh, I was actually providing feedback on a paper this morning, and this author actually laid it out in a way I thought was pretty nice, which was that AGI was software that could do most economically valuable things that humans can do, at least as well as humans, in a reasonable range, you know, while ASI, artificial super intelligence, was clearly well beyond humans in many, if not all, economically valuable category. Now, this person's very economically oriented, so they, maybe they were over. Yeah, but this becomes interesting with LLMs because you could imagine a deep neural net-based system that could do 90, 95% of the jobs that people do for money without being able to generalize very well, which would be because the modern economy has reduced most jobs to something that's kind of rote and repetitive and similar to what other people have, have done before. But on the other hand, an economy made 100% of this sort of deep neural net would never advance fundamentally as human society has. So 
I'm no longer sure you would need AGI to automate the economy very substantially, although I do think you would need it to automate science or art to a full extent. Yep. Robin Hansen makes this point as well, that perhaps the real binding point is the rate of advancement of a society. Which is hard to measure, isn't it? Hard to quantify in an objective way. At least when you're inside of it, right? The historians, you know, there's all this historiometrics that are quite interesting. But anyway, we are very short on time today, so we could talk about this all day, but we're going to move on. And give us a two-minute version of the history of OpenCog, which got you up to about today. Sure thing. So my own AGI journey began more on the theory of mind side. I was trying through the 80s and 90s to come up with a mathematical model of how intelligence works. And I was screwing around with a bunch of self-organizing complex system approaches to AGI in the 90s. And then when, when the internet came out, I sort of pivoted a bit and thought, well, we could make a distributed sort of decentralized AGI system running on a whole big network of processors feeding in a whole bunch of data from all over the place. I conceived a system called WebMind and had a company of that name in, in the late 90s, which was basically a huge decentralized knowledge graph of AI agents. Now that proved a hard architecture to make work efficiently given the computing infrastructure of that time. So I created a new project called Novamente. Novamente had an architecture where you had a sort of knowledge graph or knowledge hypergraph, then a bunch of AI agents carrying out different learning and reasoning algorithms acting together on this knowledge hypergraph and acting, or at least so was the idea, synergetically on this knowledge hypergraph, helping each other to do their different AI things. Now, OpenCog originated as an open sourcing of a parts of a proprietary AI project called the Novamente Cognition Engine, which we open sourced in 2008 or so, after Novamente had been around maybe six, seven years. And it was developed by myself, a number of colleagues. There was some sort of random open source developer. It was, it was mostly a group that was working with me doing various government and commercial projects using OpenCog Engine. And there was the idea that we have OpenCog as a sort of generic AGI platform, and then a particular cognitive architecture developed on top of that that we were calling Cog Prime. And I'm in the middle of trying to come up with a better name for that cognitive architecture at the moment. Now, we played with OpenCog for quite a while. We built some cool prototypes, the back ends of a few commercial systems on it. Around three years ago, a number of us engaged with OpenCog, though not all, not actually the lead developer on OpenCog, Linus Vepstas, but a number of us engaged with OpenCog, decided it may be time for a from-the-ground rewrite of the system. Not because OpenCog was bad, just because the world had changed a lot since then, and we had learned a lot from our prototyping. So we started building a new version of OpenCog that we called OpenCog Hyperon, and that was a big decision because it's pain in the butt to stop doing AGI R&D for a while and rebuild your infrastructure. We're still in the middle of rebuilding the infrastructure, but we're at least able to prototype new AI algorithms and approaches on the new Hyperon system now, though it's not yet as scalable as it will be six or 12 months from now. So now, while building out the new version of OpenCog, we're starting to flesh out AI learning and reasoning algorithms and the new version of the Cog Prime cognitive architecture on top of the new version of OpenCog Hyperon. And while daydreaming about the next version, OpenCog uh, Tachyon, which will be quantum computer based. But we'll, we'll leave that for later. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably be off to the AI in the sky by then, I suspect, but we shall see. You will be uploaded to OpenCog Hyperon by then. Yeah. Oh, okay. That would be cool. Okay. You know, just for the audience's benefit, I actually played around with OpenCog a bit back in 2014, maybe early 2015. Used it as a uh, back end for an AI, minimal consciousness, artificial deer that I had running in Unity and uh, had to do some of my own system stuff because, and I'd always complain, the goddamn thing was, while in theory, a multi-processor, 
practically it wasn't unless you did it yourself. And so I had to write my own communications infrastructure to be able to run multiple instances and communicate between them and stuff like that. And I always pushed from the very early days, as Ben no doubt remembers, tirelessly and tiresomely, no doubt, for a uh, true distributed atom space. And it looks like you guys are making some real progress on that. Yeah, it's been a learning experience in a variety of different ways, trying to build both an AGI and the infrastructure the AGI needs to run on. You know, we built the old version of OpenCog with a small group of people and not that much resources at a time when AI was not as popular as now. So, I mean, we have a larger and broader team behind the Hyperon effort, including more folks with distributed systems and computing hardware and programming language background and so forth. So I think we brought a broader group of people into building the the infrastructure, which is great. My own personal interest with my sort of individual contributor and researcher hat on is still on building the AGI running on top of this infrastructure. But on the other hand, if you look at, you know, what's allowed transformers and other deep neural nets to do what they've done in the last few years, it largely has been advances on the infrastructure, right? I mean, it's NVIDIA hardware infrastructure. It's all these, you know, matrix multiplication libraries. It's MapReduce, right? So, I mean, it, it is a lot of the plumbing for doing things scalably and efficiently that has let modest variations on previously existing deep neural net architectures do so much more amazing things now due to being deployed at scale. So, I mean, I, mean, I think I've gained a healthy respect now, even more than I had before for like, for scale, like, okay, you really do need to focus on all the plumbing to make it possible to run this stuff on huge data and huge processing infrastructure. And otherwise, you may have the right algorithm and the right knowledge representation, and it still doesn't do very much. You never knew that it would have, you know, led to the singularity if you just ran it on a shitload more, more machines, because the continuity of function from like BERT to GBT2, GB3, GBT4, I mean, it wasn't all that obvious when you ran BERT and the first Transformers. It was really cool, but it wasn't totally obvious what GBT4 would be able to do once you put that amount of data and, and firepower behind it, right? I'm hoping we will see similar sorts of phenomena in OpenCog Hyper Online, where you have qualitative discontinuities of function as you start to do things at greater scale. You know, one of the limitations of the original OpenCog, damn difficult to scale it up, not impossible, but it wasn't really natively designed for that. The second was the Atomese language was more than a little peculiar, at least from my perspective. And it looks like one of the things you guys have done is done a deep dive into the language you really want, and it's called Meta. Why don't you talk a little bit about what walls you ran into with Atomese and what leap do you see coming from Meta? M-E-T-T-A, by the way, people. Yeah, I think the there's really two key technical aspects to OpenCog Hyperon. One is the meta language, and the other is the sort of distributed and decentralized atom space infrastructure. So the, the atom space underlies both of these, which is a knowledge metagraph. So knowledge graph, I'll assume people know what it is. It's infrastructure for managing nodes and links. A hypergraph is like a graph, but as links that can span more than two different nodes, so like a link among three, five, or 12 nodes. A metagraph is a little more broad. You can have links pointing to links or links pointing to subgraphs. And these are typed labeled nodes and links. So you can have weights on them, like probabilities or fuzzy values. You can have types associated with nodes and links where the types themselves could be represented by whole metagraphs, right? So, and these atom space metagraphs could live in RAM, or they could live on disk, they could live on one machine, they could live spread across many different machines. Now, meta is basically a programming language designed so that a meta program is a chunk of knowledge metagraph. And what a meta program does is take chunks of knowledge metagraph and output other chunks of knowledge metagraph, right? So it's it's a native language for knowledge metagraph rewriting, and it's designed for 
self-modification and that a program is a bunch of knowledge metagraph, which can then be rewritten by meta programs and so forth. So this, in some ways, is similar to the vision underlying LISP, which in many ways is the original AI language, right? I mean, a LISP, LISP was the first really usable language to break down the division between data and program, right? So a LISP program is also content that can be fed into LISP programs, and it's easy to have LISP programs generate or rewrite LISP programs. It stands for list processing, right? So LISP's most natural native data structure is a list, right? Whereas meta, its most natural native data structure is a typed weighted metagraph. And that's, I mean, in theory, you can boil a type weighted metagraph down to a list, which is fine. On the other hand, in actual programming and algorithmic practice, that can be a cumbersome and, and annoying thing to do. So, I mean, having something conceptually lisp-like, but bottoming out on a weighted typed metagraph is different from a practical programming language perspective. So you, in OpenCog Classic, as we're now calling it, the old original OpenCog, we basically were using Scheme, which is sort of an object-oriented version of Lisp as the primary scripting language to manipulate the nodes and links in the OpenCog atom space. And this this was okay, but the fact that Scheme is Lisp, which wants to be a Lisp processing language, means that things were a bit awkward here and there, right? And there was also this division between the scripting language, which was mostly Scheme, and then the cognitive content of the atom space. I mean, you could, you could write a transform to turn a Scheme script into nodes and links, but it was an extra thing to do. And we also had Python and Haskell shells you could use to manipulate nodes and links in the original atom space. But those were not as well fleshed out as the Scheme shell. So the decision to write our own programming language was done after a lot of painful thought and debate, because I think there's a long history in the AI world of people thinking, well, writing my AGI would be much easier if I had the right programming language. So let's make the right programming language. Then 20 years later, you became a program language researcher and did a lot of amazing programming language research, but you didn't actually make much progress on the AI, which was your motive for making the programming language. So we that's why I didn't write a custom programming language in the original OpenCog. On the other hand, coming into OpenCog Hyperon, I mean, we had a bunch of specific code written for the old OpenCog that we knew what it was. And like, we knew this was the code that we wanted to make smaller, more compact, more elegant, and more efficient. So it wasn't sort of jumping into it just totally out of the clear blue sky. I mean, we, we had probabilistic logic engine, evolutionary learning engine. We had some code for operating virtual agents and analyzing biology data and so on. And so then we plunge into that, the creation of a new programming language with a bunch of practical stuff in mind. One thing I found much to my delight as I plunged into the modern world of programming languages is actually the field of programming languages had advanced quite a lot since 2008 when I architected the original OpenCog system, right? And without as much fanfare as advances in AI or some other areas, but like quietly the world of functional programming had just advanced quite dramatically. So, I mean, I've been a Haskell programmer since 92, 93, when before monads were there, like when Haskell was quite primitive. But as I delved into type theory, which was important to me because I was looking at a lot of value for types, nodes, and links in the knowledge metagraph. When I looked into type theory, I could see, wait a minute, we now have dependently typed programming languages like Adra or Idris. And Idris too is even reasonably fast to run, which is this dependently typed language is quite elegant. And you you had some academic researchy languages which have gradual dependent types, which is, it's a very wonky technical thing, but it's an advance in design of functional programming languages that just wasn't there in 2008. I mean, in, in the prologue world, 
you, know, you have experimental prologues that do unification very, very efficiently, like accounting for garbage collection in real time while you unify complex expressions. So I found there was just a lot of advance in the programming language world that we could draw on to build a kind of language you couldn't have built in 2008. So when we created Meta, we were trying to take everything that had been done in the functional and logic programming world in the last couple of decades and sort of one-up it by getting even more hardcore, weird, and abstract. So when you say programming for OpenCog Classic was a bit weird, it was, but there are many ways of being weird. So programming in Meta is also very weird, but we're trying to make it weird in a better sort of way, right? Because, I mean, we it's a different sort of language than has ever been played with before. It unifies aspects of functional programming and logic programming in different ways than, than have been have been done before, but we're trying to make it weirdly elegant rather than weirdly ugly, right? And I think we've had enough people playing around with the early versions of Meta to get some validation that it does work out that way. So the, the base version of Meta is very, very, very abstract and simple. I mean, it's really just like the simplest possible way you could write a language that is a chunk of Metagraph and that exists to rewrite Metagraph into Metagraph. So like the, even like the notion of equals is left as undefined as possible. So you could use homotopy type theory to overload what equality means. And there's no notion of type in the base language. You have to introduce type as a certain class of nodes and links with a certain notion of type equivalence and inheritance in it, which itself is boiled down to into a bunch of nodes and links. So you, we're really trying to boil down to the lowest possible level of plumbing. And what's been interesting to set a couple of use cases. So we, we invited some folks from the NARS community, non-axiomatic reasoning system, which is a different AGI approach than my own sort of cog prime AGI approach. We invited them to implement a version of NARS in OpenCog. And then a guy named Doug Miles, who I'd known a while because he helped out with Hanson Robots a long time ago. He has his own AGI approach called Logic Moo, which is sort of crisp logic done mostly in, in Prolog. So we invited these two groups to implement stuff in Meta, and they both fell in love with the language. I mean, they're like, well, this is just an easier, more elegant way to implement our AI stuff than anything we've seen before. Wow, it's cool to have functional logic programming in the same framework. Like, yes, it's rough around the edges, but everything is so simple and concise, right? And we didn't get that feedback from people doing development in OpenCog Classic, that just the language itself was fun and cool and easy to work with, even if you were bringing your own AI methods to it, right? So I think that's been interesting to see and we are using that community to help refine the language and how it works. The other interesting feedback we've gotten is on the scalability side, we've been working with Greg Meredith, who had developed his own programming language called Rolang, which is very efficient for concurrent processing. And what Greg has done is develop a source to source rewriting tool that rewrites meta source into Rolang source and then runs the Rolang efficiently using the Rolang runtime. And again, this is enabled because of the way that meta was implemented. It would have been hard to do that in OpenCog Classic due to the mix of node and link stuff with scheme stuff. But we had a formal definition of meta. So then you can take the meta from the formal description rewrite it to a different language and compile it and run it efficiently on whatever hardware you want. Then we can compile Rolang into hypervector manipulations that we're then running on the, the APU, which is a custom chip for associative processing made by, by GSI, right? So I think we've managed to create something that is fun for people doing other AI stuff to use and that is sort of crisp and concise enough you can compile it into additional forms to run efficiently on different sorts of, of hardware. So that's 
certainly still a work in progress, but it, it's been gratifying to get that validation. And I've seen the same in my own little experiments using Meta myself. I'm mostly doing combination of theory and management stuff now, but I have an interest in what's called algorithmic chemistry, where you sort of have a sort of soup of little uh, rewrite rules which rewrite each other, right? So it's like a pool of rewrite rules, rewriting rewrite rules, so that they can better rewrite rewrite rules. And my experiments with implementing algorithmic chemistry systems in Meta is it's not much code, and the code is very transparent, right? Like, it's fun to do. The things you've said that attract me, and hey, when you're ready, I'll take a look at it, is the idea that the code itself is formally in the metagraph, right? So you don't have this external back and forth, so fucking nightmarish between the external scripting and the language, etc. That would be gigantic. Uh, other question I have for you, if I remember correctly from the old OpenCog, every atom in the atom space was probabilistic in nature. You didn't have to use it, but it was there. Have you retained that attribute or is it probabilisticness less kind of pervasive in the design than it is now? So there's, I guess it is less pervasive at the level of the plumbing of the atom space and the language, but not less pervasive in the cog prime AGI design that I'm implementing anyway. If we get deep into the weeds, in the old atom space design, when you looked under the hood, each atom was sort of a separate object or entity in the code. If you look under the hood in the default implementation of the Hyperon atom space, which works with the, the Rust base interpreter for Meta, atoms are not necessarily implemented as distinct software objects under the hood. You sort of have a forest of these trees and, and the, the atoms are represented in there. And if you need to grab an atom to use it, it can be plucked out and labeled within Meta. But it seems to be more efficient not to necessarily represent the atoms individually. In a similar way, in the old atom space of the original OpenCog, Every atom came with a truth value or attention value object, and then you could associate other values with it. But the truth and attention value were, were built in. We don't have built-in values like that in the new atom space because it was just inefficient because there are many cases where you didn't need them. I mean, I mean, an, a blank truth value didn't take up that much memory, but it's, it's just... Not necessary to have, to have it there, right? So good. I think those are good design decisions. That was one of my take was. So I mean, if you have like a something like a while loop or a conditional or something, it doesn't need a probabilistic truth value necessarily, but you're still representing it in the atom space. It doesn't need an attention value at that level. You want to associate attention, maybe with the whole meta script, but you don't need to bother to associate an attention value with each conditional inside. Exactly. Exactly. You know what happens. As everyone who does software knows, when you build up a complex system over time, assumptions that made sense four years ago were baked deeply into the plumbing, and then it just becomes annoying to get rid of them, right? Oh, yeah. We all know that problem. <laughs> what they call technical debt, right? <laughs> I mean, that happened a lot with the OpenCog Classic system because, you know, we developed OpenCog Classic, and then we developed PLN Reasoning and Moses program learning within that system. So now, if my hypothesis is right, that the collection of learning reasoning algorithms associated with the cog prime cognitive design is basically a good way to build human level AGI, if that is right, I mean, we've been able to architect Meta and Hyperon so that this collection of algorithms will be very elegant and efficient on this infrastructure. We've also built it for efficient interfacing with external deep neural net libraries. And this was actually the sort of tipping point that led us to develop the new version of OpenCog is Alexei Polopov and, and Vitaly Bogdanov, who were working with me, they wanted to connect Torch, the deep neural net library, with OpenCog Classic. And they did it in a fairly nice way. So like each neural net layer within the Torch computation graph corresponds to a different node in the atom space. 
and they had it so composition of open cog nodes mapped sort of isomorphically into composition of layers in, in Torch, right? So this, by the way, was a big advantage of Torch over TensorFlow. Torch gives you programmatic access to the underlying computation graph, and TensorFlow doesn't for whatever weird weird design reason, right? So they made that work. But to do that, they, they integrated something in OpenCog class that they called a pointer value, which was like a, a value associated with a node, which was a pointer to something outside the graph, which was, in a way, a horrible hack. It's super general, but it is a huge, horrible hack. It's bad, but it, the way they were using it wasn't bad, right? I mean, it, it's just like pointers in, in C or C++. C, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. Don't I mean, do that, that guy. Damn it, but once in a while it's handy, right? I mean, <laughs> they can be abused in egregious ways. I mean, they're used all over the implementation of every operating system, right? But yeah, Linus Vepsis, who was the main developer of the plumbing of OpenCog Classic, basically didn't want to merge pointer values into the, the main code base of OpenCog because they're ugly. But we're just like, well, wait a minute, but how else do we do this, right? Linus was like, well, don't implement your neural net in the atom space. We're like, well, long run, we really do want to do that. That's the right way to do it. On the other hand, that will take years. And right now we want to experiment with CNNs for computer vision together with declarative logic in OpenCog. We don't want to have to wait several years to be able to do all that neural net stuff in the atom space. So, I mean... For a while, we maintained two forks of OpenCog Classic, but on the other hand, it was a horrible hack, right? So now in the way grounding of atoms works, which is the association of atoms being nodes or links, the way grounding of atoms works in OpenCog Hyperon lets you associate a node or link with part of the torch computation graph in just a more direct and natural way without needing some hack like like a pointer value. There's also a more general way to, under your custom functions, to reach out to any external code in a less hacky way. Absolutely. We're using that to connect with Isabel, which is a theorem prover, right? Because if you're doing common sense logic in OpenCog, sometimes you want to do some very low level logical reasoning steps where you're like rearranging quantifiers and variables in a kind of mechanical way. You can outsource that to a theorem prover like, like Isabel that's really good at, actually it's outsourcing that to other theorem provers using the Isabel sledgehammer, right? So yeah, you, you can connect with a simulation engine, you could connect with a theorem prover, you could connect with the deep neural net library. And the mechanics is there to make that A, not be hacky on an implementation level, but B, to make it easy to reason about that within within Meta, which is what is accomplished with monads in, in Haskell, for example. You can bury within a monad the ability to do a lot of messy stuff. You identify the properties of that messy stuff within the properties of your monad. Then you can reason about this external stuff within your elegant functional programming system, right? In a way, Linus was right to bitch about pointer value because it was opaque to the atom space, right? The properties of what you were doing with that pointer were not exposed to the atom space. On the other hand, we didn't have a great alternative to that in the old system, right? And so now, now we're doing a bunch interfacing OpenCog Hyperon with large language models. Now, we also are very interested in creating something that does what LLMs do, but deployed within, within the atom space so that you can do neural symbolic learning like within training of a transformer-like model. I mean, I think that's a very important area of research, but we don't want to be restricted to that. We want to be able to go back and forth with deep neural nets that are doing amazing stuff right now. Yeah, everybody is on, they're in a sweet spot between hardware and software right now where they're able to just roar ahead in terms of producing useful results. And it would be a bad decision to choke yourself by the performativity or lack thereof of the atom space. You know, they're just engineered at totally different levels of intensity and scale. Yeah, but so this gets in, which would be a whole other podcast maybe, but if you look at what we can do with Meta to Rolang to Hypervectors to the GSI APU chip, then you're getting something that's, conceptually, a lot like what's done in going from deep neural nets to matrix libraries to, to GPUs, right? So, I mean, I think we're going to have to do something parallel 
to what's been done with that whole stack to GPUs for atom space, which in the end may realize Linus's idea that, no, you should be doing this on the atom space. Someday, but not today, right? Not today. You have, you have to be able to climb the hills where they are, right? Well, that's right. I mean, it could be a year from now. I mean, we're actually, we have prototypes of this stuff on the GSI hardware, which is in production, right? So, I mean, it's, it's not just a concept, but yet it's not, I can't train a transformer on that yet right now. Like we're still working out kinks in mapping of hypervector into GSI, right? So yeah, there's the need for parallelization of development avenues. And we sort of failed with the old OpenCog to build a diverse enough, energetic enough open source community. I think partly because the software was a pain to work with in some ways, Partly it was just a different historical era, right? I mean, I think in the modern historical era, there's a lot of people who want to jump into AGI. I think that once Hyperon is a little further along and we're planning to launch something we're willing to call an alpha version in April of this year. After that, we're going to start with hackathons and, and you know broader giving some grants for open source developers on, on Hyperon. So I'm, I'm optimistic we can do a better job of nourishing a broader open source developer community with the new version, partly because it's easier to work with, partly because more people love AGI now than did before. And part of the parallelization we hope to get from that is, yeah, we want people banging away on using existing deep neural nets together with Hyperon to make things neural symbolic. On the other hand, we also want people banging away on the more difficult research of doing, you know, hierarchical attention-based pattern recognition networks totally in, in the atom space, because I think that probably is a better way to get rid of hallucinations and the other irritating problems that you see with transformers than just banging on neural nets in, in their current form or some minor variation thereof. Yeah, and people like Gary Marcus have been continually, sometimes overly tediously, pointing out the limitations of today's transformer-based LLMs to do various kinds of formal reasoning. You can trick them quite easily, because that's not what they're designed for. They're just a statistical predictor of next tokens. Fucking amazing they do anything. Well, but they weren't designed to write Python either, and they, and they can do it, right? Well, that's true. They could write movie scripts. They weren't designed for that, and they can do that. Yeah. I think you could go a lot further than the state of the art with LLMs for complex multi-step reasoning. On the other hand, the cost benefit will get worse and worse. As one example, as Jim, you'd remember in Cog Prime and in the plumbing of Open Cog Classic, we had these two component truth values where you maintain a strength and confidence rather than just a probability value. So it's like a probability, and then it's the probability that that probability is accurate, right? So I wonder if you trained a transformer neural net based on two component truth values at, at every level, I wonder how that would deal with the, the hallucination problem. Because you instead of just making a probabilistic prediction, which is what transformers do, you make a probabilistic prediction where you know how much evidence underlies that prediction you're making. I think if you did things like manage higher order uncertainty through the neural net training process of a transformer, you might be able to get a transformer that in a way knows when it's making shit up versus knows when it's making a confident prediction. If you do that, you can probably do more confident multi-step reasoning to a certain extent because Part of the reason multi-step reasoning doesn't work well is the bullshit blows up exponentially over each step of the reasoning. But the thing is, that's still not going to work as well as a human at complex multi-step reasoning. And it gets more and more expensive as you propagate all these higher order uncertainties through the system. Yeah, I think Gary overstates the case against LLMs. On the other hand, he is seeing some fundamental truth there, which is, as you said, like these things are not architected to do abstract reasoning, like complex multi-step reasoning relies on abstraction in a fundamental way. And transformers are not wired for abstraction. I mean, they're wired to munch together a massive number of concrete data patterns 
in a different way than doing abstraction. And this brings us back to one of the nice things about atom space is it's a very elegant way to represent data patterns at multiple levels of abstraction. I mean, which I think is important for general intelligence. There's a whole bunch of learning theory that ties together the ability to abstract with the ability to generalize, which underlies Occam's razor and other associated heuristics. Like if you have a simple model of a bunch of complex data, mathematically, there's a lot of reasons to believe that gives you the ability to make hypotheses that will abstract beyond the data bit that you've seen, right? And I mean, deep neural nets aren't doing much of that. I'm sure you've heard me say more than once is my Rutt's idea of the quickest road to AGI is to solve heuristic induction. I would say something like the Hyperon architecture is more likely to get you there than LLMs. LLMs, you're basically using very loosey-goosey basins of attraction in a kind of strange way. I am looking forward to playing with it. Let's move on. We're very short on time. I want to get all the high points here. In your 70-page paper, where it was, you did mention your old standby, cognitive synergy, six times, but it wasn't quite as central to the story as it used to be. Could you explain to people your concept of cognitive synergy and how you see it in this next generation? The long paper that we're talking about covers both the Hyperon infrastructure and the cognitive architecture, which was historically called Cog Prime, and which we'll have a new name for probably within a few weeks, but I don't know what it will be yet. So I would say cognitive synergy is at the emergent level, so it's not something you wire into the operating programming language, but the notion of cognitive synergy, on the face of it, it's pretty simple. A human-level AGI system has a both modular, fragmented aspect and a unified aspect. You need both of those aspects, which is one of the many sort of dialectical dualities in creating human-level intelligence. So the modular aspect, one way to get at it is to look at different types of memory, which is something that cognitive science and cognitive psychology have delved into in great detail. And this is another one of the largely unsung domains of radical advance during my career. Like when I started studying cognitive science in the 80s, or even teaching cognitive science in the 90s, we did not have as solid a knowledge of the different sorts of memory in the human brain, how, the, how they work in the mind and brain, how they interact or operate with each other. Like Cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience have advanced a fuck of a lot, just like I was saying, you know, functional programming language and infra infrastructure has. Like there, there's been exponential advance in so many of these sort of academic research areas that nobody thinks about along, along, alongside the exponential advance in, in things like GPUs and, and, and so on, the computer vision that everyone sees. So... One thing we see in cognitive science, I mean, we see the human brain in the way it does memory is a bit compartmentalized. And you can see that to the point where like a lesion in one part of the brain will cause someone to lose very specific kind of, of memory, like the ability to conjugate verbs or the memory of what people were wear in their life history, but not what cars were wear in their life history or something, right? So we have like an episodic memory of the narrative of our life history. We have a procedural memory for how to do stuff. We have a declarative memory, which is sort of facts and beliefs, and it gets much more fine-grained than that, actually, into different subtypes of memory. And each of these types of memory has a different dynamic between working memory that you're using while you're doing stuff in real time and long-term memory. Each of these types of memory has different learning and reasoning heuristics associated with it in, in the human mind, right? And I think that came about because of evolutionary pressures, which you could go through step by step. Like, what do we need in evolutionary history in terms of episodic memory? What do we need in evolutionary history in terms of the interaction between working in long-term memory regarding procedures, right? So you could choose to ignore all that 
uh, just architect an AGI system in some other way that might get much smarter than people. You could try to emulate how the brain works regarding all these types of memory and associated learning and reasoning, which is really interesting, computational neuroscience, but then you run into a lot of places where the neuroscience just isn't well known yet. What I've chosen to do in the cog prime cognitive architecture is try to roughly emulate the way the human mind works in terms of varieties of memory and associated reasoning and learning heuristics, but not try to drill down to the, to the neural level. So that means like, okay, we know we need to deal with declarative memory of facts and procedures. We know we, know we need to deal with uh, procedural memory. We know we need to deal with episodic sensory memory. Let's make sure we have good representations for each of these and good learning and reasoning algorithms for each of these. Now, so far, we didn't even get to cognitive synergy yet, right? Like you could say SOAR or ACT-R, which are classic cognitive architectures from the good old-fashioned AI world, also try to break things down to the different kinds of memory, learning, and reasoning that the human mind does based on cognitive science. But they really break things down into different modules. The way that classic SOAR deals with declarative knowledge and learning of facts and procedures is totally separate from the way good old-fashioned SOAR deals with learning and representing procedures. And I think that is not going to be scalable. And we've already talked about why scalability is, is so important. So to make things scalable, I think you need to be able to translate your declarative representation into procedural form and your procedural representation and into declarative form and so on with sensory and episodic and so forth. So you need to be able to translate the representations associated with each type of memory into the representations associated with other types of memory, which is a matrix of, of cases, right? And But then more subtly than that, the learning and reasoning approaches associated with each type of memory need to be able to share their intermediate state with the learning and reasoning approaches associated with other types of memory so as to help each other out when they get stuck in doing their learning or, or reasoning. You can model this quite abstractly using category theory, which I did in, in the paper some years ago, or you can look at it very nitty gritty in terms of specific tasks that, that human-like agents are, are doing, right? So like if you're if you're learning to serve a tennis ball or pick up a cup or something, on the one hand, you're doing something reinforcement learning-ish to learn a procedure to, to pick up that cup. On the other hand, if you formulate that in a sensory way, you're looking at images of yourself picking up that cup, which you can learn from, and there's a lot of eye-hand coordination in how people learn this. If you're looking at it in a declarative way, you're thinking about what you're doing wrong and why are you always smelling the cup and trying to draw a logical conclusion about it, right? So it's both an abstract mathy thing and a very, very concrete nitty-gritty thing to have a sharing of information on the sort of learning and reasoning level and the knowledge representation level with all the different things a human-like mind does. And I would conjecture that any kind of mind that has fairly limited resources and needs to do a sufficient diversity of different tasks is going to end up with a modular architecture that then needs holistic cooperation among the modules, and that leads you to cognitive synergy. Now, it, it might be that if you have enough resources, you don't need a modular architecture. Like maybe that's just a hack that you need to do. Nature had to do it because nature had limited resources, right? Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. So when you get from AGI to ASI, maybe the ASI like synthesizes a modular architecture on the fly for each new task it has to do or something, right? Like rather than having a sort of fixed modular architecture. But if, if you're following a path of first human level, vaguely human-like ATI, and then ASI, then I think you're led to, to an architecture that's heavy on the cognitive synergy. And I think in LLM land, they will be led that way too. Like if, you, if you're making GBT5 that invokes Wolfram Alpha to do logical reasoning or something, I think then after they've done that and run across the fact that it's not very scalable, 
they're going to say, well, we want to share the intermediate states of Wolfram Alpha with the transformer, and we want Wolfram Alpha to have access to a vector of the internal state of the transformer to guide itself, and then you're doing cognitive synergy between Wolfram Alpha and your transformer, right? Now, they're, they're not there in GPT-4 in terms of how Wolfram Alpha plugin is interoperating with the ensemble of transformers inside GPT-4. You can see how that would naturally evolve within an LLM-centric universe just in the desire to decrease the amount of processing cycles used by both the LLM and the Wolfram Alpha theorem prover when they have to do stuff together. Like, they'll just be more efficient if they have visibility into what each other are doing internally. I don't see any sign of that happening, at least not in the commercial or even the open source world. Stephen Wolfram understands the desirability of this very well. But the software on each side is not architected for that absolutely whatsoever, right? So Basically, the model that everybody's using is so-called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, where something goes out to some software, some latent semantic vector database or Wolfram Alpha or fucking Bing or something. Results come back, they're manipulated, they're cleaned up, and then they're sent to the LLM. But there's no interpenetration at this point. No, I mean, I've talked to Stephen Wolfram about this. I mean, he probably better than the OpenAI guys. He and a number of people within Microsoft Research fully understand the desirability of doing this. But I mean, Wolfram Alpha not only does not have uncertainty built in like OpenCog Classic does, it has no natural way to insert uncertainty into its plumbing of how it does algebraic simplification and so forth. Whereas a transformer, it is an uncertain inference engine, right? It's doing statistical stuff. And Wolfram Alpha is not doing statistical stuff. This gets back to the advantage of doing everything in atom space. I mean, really the right way to get cognitive synergy between a transformer and a logical inference engine is to put the transformer in atom space and the logical inference engine in atom space. I mean, then then you have the same meta-representational fabric underlying the two of them. I mean, then, then the cognitive synergy comes easy. Now, how we can do that interoperating between a transformer as given now and logical reasoning within OpenCog Atom Space is hackier and more partial, right? And we can do some things because we're doing a statistical logic inside Atom Space. So we're, we're ahead of Wolfram Alpha. You can do sort of one direction there. You can't that well inject logical stuff into the transformer, right? This is interesting. This is real cognitive synergy. Get various tools to move down one or two levels in detail and use Hyperon as their meeting ground, essentially. Because I'm still skeptical about doing a transformer in Hyperon, maybe, maybe with this hardware acceleration. But even if you can't, you know, get down a couple levels and find representations that they can interact with and have the structuring from the rest of the Hyperon environment, then maybe you can do some really cool stuff that you can't do with this clean line between retrieval and generation, which is all we have today, basically. I think we can do transformers in Hyperon that will be more efficient than the transformers they're doing now, which is, if it's true, it will be because of Rolang rather than Meta. It's because Rolang allows you to exploit parallelism in a more flexible way than MapReduce and similar libraries. And if you look at what's going on inside a transformer, when it does inference, which has to be done many times during training as well, it's doing more stuff in parallel than needs to be. I mean, it's multiplying parts of the matrix that don't need to change. You can leverage your your parallel processing resources far more efficiently than is actually done on the NVIDIA hardware by doing matrix multiplication now. And Rolang seems to let you do that. So, I mean, I mean, there there is a quite interesting story there, which is more about how to do concurrent processing efficiently beyond MapReduce type stuff. But you're right, if... Even if that doesn't work, there's a lot of interesting hybrid architectures, though. Because if if you break down how a transformer is, like when you do fine tuning, you're retraining the top few levels of a transformer, or you do LoRa, you're doing even even less of that, like low rank adaptation. You're not touching the the base model. So one can take 
the base model of a transformer, and you can replace the top couple layers of the transformer with stuff inside Hyperon, and then that can still work efficiently. Then you're using reasoning to update these top few layers while the base model is still what it is. This is a sort of intermediate level of difficulty. It still needs, I mean, just doing the top couple layers of the transformer, which is where a lot of the attention magic is happening. I mean, this still needs things to be way more scalable than OpenCog Classic, but it doesn't need things to be as scalable as you'd need to train a whole like GBD4 scale network using using OpenCog. So there, there's a lot of interesting flexibility to play with, actually. Is there anybody in the uh, generative base model world looking at what you guys are doing and thinking things like this? Well, our own team is. Within SingularityNet, we have a team of like 20 people just 25 maybe doing just transformer neural nets. We have our own server farm training transformers for language, speech, music, financial data, a whole bunch of different things. And then a separate team working on OpenCog AGI stuff. And these are run by close friends of each other, right? So, I mean, we have been playing with it. What I would say is people that I know in the nuts and bolts, like transformer neural net world, they have too much other even lower hanging fruit to, to play with and that they, they haven't gotten to this yet. I have found people in the hardware space very interested in this though. So we have a number of people working with who are building large server farms aimed at serving transformers to a large number of commercial customers. And these guys are just interested in anything that will decrease the cost of training and, and inference. As you know, also, there are people looking at other models other than multi-head traditional transformer architectures, which could be an order of magnitude or more and more efficient as well. Well, yes. I don't know if I've introduced you to Alex Arorbia or if you've intersected him. He's at RIT. He has a different algorithm than backpropagation for training neural nets, which is based on predictive coding. He's working loosely with Carl Friston, who you will have run across. Yeah, yep. Know his work well. Don't know him. Yeah. I mean, I love Friston as, as a human being. He's a great maverick. I have mixed feelings scientifically toward his approach for computer science. I'm not going to debate him on neuroscience. I'm not a neuroscientist. I would say Arorbia's stuff is the first thing within the Friston universe that fully makes sense to me on a technical level in terms of doing predictive coding based learning as an alternative to backpropagation. And I think that it's a localized learning method in a way that backpropagation isn't, right? It's much more elegant and efficient than, say, Bengio's difference target propagation, which was along, along similar lines. But it also has a clear probabilistic semantics, which would make it nice to go back and forth with probabilistic reasoning inside OpenCog. So this is another possible direction. Instead of bringing the transformers into OpenCog, if you manage to make something transformer-like which is trained using Aurobia's predictive coding rather than backpropagation, you're getting something that at least has a clear probabilistic semantics throughout the whole, the whole network on the neural net side, which, which then, then makes it easier to do cognitive synergy with probabilistic reasoning on the open cog side, right? Well, send me the link to him. I'd love to take a look at this. One of the things I'm keeping my radars out, just way wide scanning, don't need them right now, is different approaches beyond classic descendant forms of transformers. What Arobia has is a different way of learning neural nets. And this is a great unknown to me in the neural net field is to what extent have our neural net architectures become overfit to the specific pluses and minuses of backpropagation as a learning yeah. algorithm. As you know, even Jeff Hinton says that's a problem, right? Yeah, you take something like, like InfoGAN, which I played with a while ago and probably pointed out to you, which is a cool way of learning GAN-like generative models that automatically learns sort of structured noise. It automatically learns semantic latent variables of the generative model. No one managed to get that work for really complex stuff. You could use it to generate models of a face that automatically learn latent variables for the nose, mouth, and eyes. You could never use it to automatically generate images of a whole scene, for example. So you couldn't make an InfoGAN transformer. Now, Backprop never converges when you try to train a complex InfoGAN model. Why does it never converge? Because the architecture sucks or because Backprop sucks, right? I mean, to find that out, you'd want to try to train an InfoGAN architecture, 
with a non-backprop learning mechanism. As far as I know, no one ever tried to train an infogen neural net using CMAES or some floating point GA. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, and I always remind people, don't forget about evolution. Evolution will train anything. Won't necessarily do it fast, but non-differential, fucking complicated as shit, evolutionary approaches, I still believe, are underutilized in this space. Well, that's right. So when... When backprop doesn't converge because the gradient fucks up, right? I mean, the, the gradient vanishes, well, schema ES doesn't care. So maybe you could use a floating point GA to train an infogen network. Maybe you could use Aurobia's predictive coding based method to use an infogen network. Then you could do an infogen style of transformer, which would enable a whole different sort of attention mechanism to work. Well, yeah, this is just highlighting a bigger problem, which is there's so much low-hanging fruit on traditional transformer NVIDIA hardware, you know, that 98% of the people are working in this, call it the already the status quo world, and we need more people working out on these alternatives. So this is a little bit nerdier deep dive than usual on the Jim Rutt Show. I've enjoyed the hell out of it. I hope you all have too. Thanks, Ben. All right. Thanks a lot, Jim. It's fun to get to dive into some of the inner workings because, I mean, in the end, that's what's going to make the AGI happen. Yeah, I'm particularly excited to get my hands on this thing once you declare it's worth looking at, but you know my lack of patience for software that doesn't work. When the code and the graph are the same, that's what excites me. I want to get my head around that. I think there could be dangerous things done with that. <laughs> Live dangerously, as, as Nietzsche said. All righty. Thanks again, Ben. And we'll have you back soon. All right. Bye-bye. Audio production and editing by Andrew Blevins Productions. Music by Tom Muller at modernspacemusic.com. <laughs>